Today we are ranking every legacy dungeon in Shadow of the Erd Tree from worst to best. If you're a boss looking to purchase property in the land of Shadow, consider me your personal estate agent. Our first property listing is the Fort of Reprimand. Don't be fooled by its small square meterage. This cosy stronghold is an ideal compromise for any buyer whose budget might not stretch to the Shadow Key. The Fort of Reprimand may not have the scope of other legacy dungeons, but it is densely packed, with secret paths to loot carefully hidden in plain sight, such as the Flame Drake Talisman being visible from the lower floor, encouraging you to find your way over the cages to reach it. The conveniently placed corpse hole provides easy access to the basement. Whether it's landscaping tools or horn scent bodies, the fort has all your storage needs covered. I don't know why this sicko is chilling down here. What are you doing? <laughs> Nothing. Me? <laughs> Is hanging around. Although the enemy variety here is lacking with recycled foot soldiers and omen killers, Black Knight Edred is a fun boss and the Crucible Wings are a flashy Ash of War to get your hands on. But the location's clincher must be its easy access from Gravesite Plain to Shadow Altus, allowing you to bypass Castle Ensis. An absolute dream for repeat playthroughs, making additional items and Shadow Tree fragments accessible without having to fight Rilana. If there's one thing I love, it's a gaping hole. That's why your mum and I get on so well. This guy stinks! Although, the stone coffin fissure is barely worth mentioning, boys. The location is carried by its visual spectacle and how ominous it feels as you descend to the bottom of the pit, which is spoiled by the most random selection of enemies in the DLC. Why is Leo the Misbegotten here? The only interesting encounters are the sniper worms that force you to use cover or get good at dodging, and the level design is a straight path to the end of the dungeon. It's a shame because Saint Trina deserves a better location leading up to her. Don't get me wrong, it's not offensive. The area just feels very flat from a gameplay perspective. Castle Ensis is the only legacy dungeon that needs an overhaul to reflect the quality of the boss it houses. There's a distinct lack of presentation here that's otherwise seen throughout the rest of the DLC. The Carrion themed fort needs its own identity as it pulls many assets from Carrion Manor and Rhea Lucaria. But rather than take inspiration from these areas, it's a poor imitation. You've heard of Moongrim Carrion Knight. Now get ready for Moongrithal of the Boreal Valley. Michael Zaki really pulled the goad for you over our eyes with this one, eh? Look at this photograph, every time I do it makes me laugh. Despite this, Castle Ensis does have some good moments. Rather than charging in head on, you must sneak through the waterfall to open the fort's gate. And there's nothing more satisfying than finding a secret path to some new loot. However, outside of Rolana, there isn't much here regarding interesting combat encounters, except for this Mesmer soldier channeling the Anor Londo archers. But that's probably just a skill issue on my part. I can't help but think the castle should have played like a militarised Rhea Lucaria, populated with battle mages that followed Rolana under Mesmer's crusade. Midra's Mance is unlike anywhere else in Elden Ring. It oozes atmosphere, like FromSoft just dropped a Bloodborne level into the DLC. The environmental storytelling does a great job of playing into the cosmic horror elements of the mansion's lore, from the headless corpses with protrusions, to the finger statues hidden in the Mance's hall. Although it is on the shorter side, every room has a purpose or point of interest. A diary page in the first room, a movable bookshelf reveals the path to the rafters in the second. A view of Midra edging in his boss arena at halfway point, and some light platforming to reach Nanaya in the library. Packaged with the Lord of Frenzied Flame reveal, this might be my favourite location of the DLC. However, I think there is some mispotential with Midra's Mance. If anything, the location understays its welcome. Some extra rooms like a basement or even an exterior flower garden with a frenzied twist would be lovely. Rather than fighting more Horned Warriors, I would have loved to see another Madness Lantern. An encounter in a long corridor that forces you to find an illusionary wall to sneak past, or tackle the lantern head on if you're brave enough. It would really play on the haunted house vibe of the level. Ina Ilim is the legacy dungeon I'm most conflicted about. The highlight of the area for me was discovering the secret path to Euporia and realising the city connects back to Bellarat. Is there any other random fucking nouns that we want to like chuck into this one, eh? However, this is the only instance of the level design branching from a linear path. I find this frustrating because the city is practically screaming to have diverging zones. There's so much going on here that could be explored. Although mystical at first glance, the city becomes horrifying when you realise it is likely built upon shaman bodies. The juxtaposition of this being above Bellarat gives you a glimpse of what the horn centre were like 
at the peak of their power. Hashtag Mesmer did nothing wrong, the crusade was justified. Controversial, but I like the three elemental warriors calling back to the dancing lion. They provide a suitable challenge for the final level of the DLC. It feels like a victory lap running up to the final confrontation. However, having two of them between grace sites is psychotic enemy placement. Bellarat nails the feeling of progression as you battle your way through the different layers of the city. From spider scorpions in the crypt to shadow men in the city streets and horned warriors patrolling the upper level. It's enhanced by the diverging paths and secrets held within the level. The area following the second grace stands out, offering multiple ways to navigate the zone. For example, you can bypass the horned warrior on the bridge by going through the flooded street with the manfly enemies. Also, am I the only one who missed the Mikula cross behind the rubble? Acquiring keys to find the horn sent Grand Dam and access the toxic depths had me backtracking to areas I had already explored to find new secrets. This exploration adds depth to Bellarat, something the other DLC legacy dungeons have been sorely lacking. I particularly enjoyed the return of the ulcerated tree spirit in the toxic depths. If you saw my boss ranking video, you'll know I'm not the biggest fan of the dancing lion, but his presentation and how he ties the whole level together is undeniable. And seeing Inner Ilim veiled in shadow also gives you a goal to work towards in the DLC and an idea where you'll end up later on. Shadowkeep is undoubtedly the best legacy dungeon in Shadow of the Erd Tree. There's more interconnectivity here than you can fit into a Dark Souls 1 map. Assuming the main gate wasn't accessible, I entered the keep through the flooded district instead. So, it blew my mind when I realised there was more than one way in. The specimen storehouse is the centrepiece of the dungeon, and the verticality here is insane. I can see myself discovering something new every time I play through it. It kind of functions as a hub zone, not only do several NPC quests take place here, but it also acts as a pathway to many late game areas. The gesture locked door to the hinterland, Drain the flooded district, the coffin that sets you on the path of this avatar. Will I ever make sense of this jumble? The Fire Knights are exclusive to this area and make for tough as nails enemies to battle. I felt a sense of adrenaline every time I had to deal with one, as they do not mess about. The unique variants scattered throughout the level make the dungeon feel alive, giving you lore on Mesmer's followers. They're a part of the world rather than just fodder, and the environmental storytelling is on point. The Jar Hospital was particularly unsettling, but becomes sombre when you realise Mesmer was trying to help the shamans trapped inside. Shadowkeep blends the freedom of player choice present in the open world of Elden Ring with the interconnected world of Dark Souls, making it the pinnacle of Elden Ring's level design. I want to know what your favourite legacy dungeon is in the comments, and who you think would win in a fight between Gavlan and Sir Maul. Take it easy, and I'll see you on the next one.